Amen. Again, praise God again for all of you that have joined us on tonight. Again, this is a day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it again. To God be the glory for the great things that he's done. Again, we're thankful to all of you that have tuned in with us on tonight. Again, we celebrate our risen Christ uh, who is yet alive and well. Amen. Thank God for all of you. A couple quick things to keep in mind. Again, voting is critical. Uh, with less than uh, three, four weeks left, your vote does matter. Now, here are a couple of dates to keep in mind. Number one, um, you can vote absenteeism ballot. It has to be in the mail by October the 19th. You can apply for one. And I think the last time to apply is October the 19th just as well. As you fill out your absenteeism ballot, a couple quick things to keep in mind. Number one, make sure you use a black or blue ink pen. That's number one. Number two, do not put an X or a check mark. You have to fill in the circle. Number three, if you would please, sign the outside of the ballot envelope with your name that's on your voter registration card or your legal name on your Michigan ID. Those are critical things. Now, uh, Sunday, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about how to vote in terms of uh, nonpartisan and all those things. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for, but I want you to understand that you can vote uh, straight ticket, but you have to understand how that works. So stay tuned. We're going to share that with you uh, as we go forward. Amen? Amen. Uh, the NAACP is still looking for individuals that want to be poll watchers. You can contact again uh, Mr. Terry Ford, who's the chapter president of the Saginaw NAACP. There's a brief training that you can go through, and so we hope that you'll take advantage of that. Um, so please, ma'am and sir, if you want to devote some time to make sure that we have as many eyes as we can watching, that would be greatly appreciated. Now, if you would, again, want you to like and to share. Want you to like and to share, if you could please. Like and share. Let others know that new life is on the air right now, even as we speak. And again, let's share so people know what's going on. Amen? All right. Let's kind of jump into the outline of the night. We've got some work that needs to be done. And again, I'm grateful again for this study in the book of Philippians. It's been, a, it's been such a movement in my life. I hope that it has been with you. One of the things about scripture is that when you start to deal with one, the spirit breathes and then opens your eyes to see the connectedness of other scriptures. So that's the beauty of this. And so we left off right around verse uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 14, 15, 16. And one of the things that was being said was that we should be maturing. I want to pick up on verse number 17. But before I do that, real quickly, I want to give you again, uh, and you can leave that right there. I want to give you again the maturing signs in Christ. Here again, you've been asking for it. Let me give you the 10 points. I'm not going to elaborate on them. I just want to read them for you. Number one, the highs and lows of life don't impact my relationship with God. Doesn't matter what happens in my life, it's not going to impact my relationship with God. Uh, number two, you'll find value in the dailiness and trivial seasons of life. That's critical. Number three, I love this one. You are at peace uh, with situations beyond your control. Bless the name of Jesus. Number four, don't allow disciplines to take a back seat. Um, don't allow disciplines to take a back seat. Amen. Number five, you maintain a childlike sense of wonder and awe um, as it relates to God. Number six, you do not compare yourself to others. That's why we have diversity. That's why God created us. And note this now. Um, you can be different but still learn how to appreciate um, uh, others in their uniqueness from you. All right? So that's critical. Number six, you listen to others um, who have a different viewpoint with the goal of growing and not correcting. That is so critical in this life. We can agree to disagree but yet not fall out of our ways. All right? I think that's critical. You're going to be a maturing saint in Christ. Number eight, your heart breaks for the poor and the marginalized. When you see something that's just flat out wrong, it ought to bother you. It ought to break your heart. 
and it ought to push you to want something done. Number nine, you understand Christianity does not have an off and on switch. And what that means is you can't just turn it on and off when it's convenient for you. You're always a Christian 24-7, 365. That's critical. You can't just be a Christian when things work well for you. And then obviously number 10, you have a sustainable rhythm to your life. All right? That's real critical. All right? You have a sustainable rhythm. Nothing takes you so far out of sequence that you can't stay on your path. All right? So let's jump to Philippians chapter 3, verse 17. And this is where Paul is telling them. Paul says that in Philippians 3, 17, he says, join with others. Watch what he says. This is the NIV version. Brothers, be followers together of me. Look at what he's asking them to do. And mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. In other words, what Paul is saying is, first of all, get on the bandwagon with us. That's number one. And then he says, take observation of other people just like us as an example. Now, I like that because what he's been saying to us is at the end of the day, we should always be looking for examples that we can emulate. It's important for you to keep in mind, each saint who chooses to keep pressing forward in Christ inspires others to do it. That's where you ought to come into play. Because what he's telling us is, be a follower of me, but take observation. Matter of fact, one of the things he's saying is, we should always be looking for examples. All right. I think that's critical. And as a, as a believer in Christ, you can never have too many examples. All right. You can never have too many examples. Matter of fact, Christ was our premier example. First, first Peter chapter two uh, and verse 21. First Peter chapter two and verse 21. And, and look at what Peter says in first Peter chapter two and verse number 21. Watch what he says. He says, for even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, watch this, leaving us an example, watch this, that you should follow his steps. What is God telling us? Christ was the ultimate example, and notice now, he suffered for us, leaving us an example. What does that mean? If Christ suffered for us, get this, we should be willing to suffer for others. I just got some drop mics right there because you've got to understand Christianity does not mean that every Sunday is going to be Sunday and every month like the month of May. You're going to have some good days and some bad days. And sometimes, yes, you may have to put yourself in harm's way at the expense of others. But he says he left us an example that we should follow. Let me give you another uh, example. First John, first John. Uh, chapter number two, first John chapter two, and I believe it's verse number six. Watch this. He that saith he abideth in him ought also to walk even as he walked. Did you get it? If you say you connected to Jesus Christ, then the same way that he walked, you ought to also walk just as well. Now that's critical. Because what is God telling you? You have to be an example all the time. Get this. I say this often, but it bears repeating. Christianity is a lifestyle. All right? It is something you do every, every second of the day. All right? So the question becomes, if we're going to join in the struggle... Um, if we're going to be examples for others, the question becomes, how can we help each other? And I think that's a good question. Let me, let me give you a scripture to go with this. The reason why we're helping each other is because it's a biblical mandate. Let me give you a scripture from James chapter number four. Watch this. In James chapter four, here is the biblical mandate. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. In other words, if I know what's right, hello, somebody, I know it's right and choose not to do it, it becomes a sin. All right? It becomes a sin. 
And so the Bible reminds us we have an obligation. The strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak, that you ought to uh, help those that are less fortunate than you are. And if you don't do it but have the means and the mechanism and don't, God says that's a sin. That means you got to help those that don't want to be helped. Yeah, y'all, come on, say amen just right there. So let me give you a couple of scriptures to connect with this. How can we help each other? All right, Hebrews chapter number 10. And I want to start at verse 22 uh, and read down through roughly about verse number 25. Watch this. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. And I want to read down to about verse number 25. Watch what he says. Let us draw nigh with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. That's talking about us being transformational. Watch, watch verse 23. Verse 23 says, let us hold the profession of our faith without wavering. Note that now, for he is faithful that promise. What did he promise? Watch this. Go to the next verse. And then he says this, and let us consider one another, watch this, to provoke unto love and to good works. Pause right there for a second. What is the right of Hebrews saying? The right of Hebrews is saying that we need to encourage each other, that we need to push each other, to spur each other on to what? To love and to good works. Now what that also says plain and simple is that when we see, excuse me, when we see someone that is getting off the right track, Provoke means that we are to challenge them. When we see that they don't emulate what they profess, our job is to challenge them. Now, brother, you know that's not right. Now, sister, you know that ought not be the way that we do what God has called us to do. And so as we go through this on today in this Bible study that we're in, again, our job is to encourage one another to provoke each other unto love and to good works. That's what God is saying. And so as you think about Bible study on today, God is asking us a question. When was the last time you encouraged someone? When was the last time you challenged someone? Because remember now, the Bible says iron sharpens iron. You are never sharp enough that you can't become sharper. And what that means is you must expose yourself. Hello, somebody. You must expose yourself to others so that you can become sharper in your walk with God. Look at verse number 25. Watch this. And this is a church requirement here. Look at verse 25. It says this, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves. In other words, don't take for granted coming to church. Don't take for granted being in Bible study. Don't take for granted being in prayer service. Don't take for granted our gatherings as the manner of some is, watch this, but exhorting one another And so much the more as you see the day approaching. What is he saying? The hour is getting late, brothers and sisters. The hour is getting late. And the more opportunities we have to come together, we ought to get together. Now, I want to throw this out to you. Isn't it strange that when it comes to church, you can be tired and have a slight headache and won't come to church, but you can still go to the grocery store. You can still go to the family reunion. You can still go bowling. Hello, somebody. Isn't it strange that we always have different criteria upon how we worship? When you take the same criteria, you do the very things you all ordinarily always do. Okay, y'all just got quiet there. So what is God telling us? If we're going to be an example, you can't just be one when it's convenient. So, so here's what I'm saying. If you're sick when it comes to church, then that means you ought to be sick when it comes to hanging out with your homeboys. We're talking about continuity across the board. All right? That's what God is telling. Let me give you another scripture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I want to start with verse 11. And I want to go down to verse 15. And remember now, how can we help one another? 
He says that we should join with him as an example. Watch what this verse says. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together. Watch this. And edify one another. The word edify means to build up. It means to lift up. So as believers, we ought to spend more time edifying instead of pulling down. Watch this. Even, all, even as even as also ye do. Watch this. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. Watch this verse. Watch what he tells in verse number 13. To esteem them very highly in love. Now, let me pause there. Because in verse 12 and 13, what the writer is saying, Paul is saying, remember your spiritual leaders that labor, that spend time in prayer, that are preaching, that are teaching. He says, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Love them, encourage them, lift them, support them, undergird them, bless them. And then it says this, and be at peace among yourselves. Now watch verse 14, because here is what he calls an exhortation. It's almost a directive. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient towards all men. Do you see there? He's asking you to be a great example. Watch verse 15. See that none rend hello somebody. Render evil for evil unto any man. Don't do tit for tat. They did you wrong. He's saying, don't you do wrong. All right? But ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Paul says that we should learn how to be good all the time. Remember this, and I love this verse because what the Bible is saying is that I'm going to take care of those that do you wrong. That's why it says, see that none render evil for evil. I know you want to get them back. I know they've done you wrong. I know they've taken something precious. But remember what the Bible says. Vengeance is mine. I shall repay. All right? Now, you're talking about an example. Let me give you Jesus Christ as another example. Here Jesus Christ is, he knows that the people that he has fed, that he has healed, that he has given sight to, that he's given back their hearing, that he's brought back from the dead, he knows in advance that the very people he just did good to will be the very people that will be yelling, crucify him. All right? He's telling you to be the same type of example. Now, I know some of y'all are going to struggle with that because the flesh says when somebody has done me wrong, come on, say it, get them back. Every dog got their day. You better keep looking over your shoulder. I'm going to come when you least expect it. No, no, no. That's not a spiritually mature Christian. That's somebody operating in the desires of the flesh. Now, here's my approach. You may have done me wrong. And I've expressed that, but you've also got to understand this, all right? At the end of the day, I trust that God is going to deal with you in due season as it is his will, all right? I, I, that's my peace. I know that God going to get you, whether it's right now, whether it's next week, whether it's next month, I don't know. But it's not up to me to figure that out. When you mess with a child of the king, the king is going to respond. All right? That's the key thing to keep in mind. Let's see if we can keep going. All right? Look at Philippians chapter uh, 3 and verse number uh, 18. Watch this. Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 18. Watch what he says. He says this. He says in Philippians 3.18, he says, For as I have often told you before, and now say even again, or again even with tears, many live as the enemies of the cross of Christ. Now, I want you to note something in that text. 
I want you to see the crux of everything that we are about. It's in that scripture. For many walk, of whom I've already told you often, and now tell you weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Now, notice what it didn't say. It didn't say they are the enemies of Christ. Hmm. You see it? It says they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Now, that is pivotal to everything that you and I are talking about. The cross is the finished work of God. All right? It's the finished work. And I want you to note this now. America is okay with you talking about Christ, but don't bring that cross up. The minute you bring that cross up, they're going to start talking about separation of church and state. All right? It seems as though doctrine is not as much an issue as is true about the cross. Because, see, what you've got to understand is that the cross is the finishing work of Christ and God. The cross now says, in essence, God is finished with this life as we know it and is prepared to move forward. All right? Let me give you a couple of scriptures. Um, 2 John, 2 John chapter 2 uh, and verse number 7. And I want you to understand this. All right, 2 John chapter 2 and verse number 7. Or, yeah, 2 John chapter 2. Wait a minute, 1 John. Let me look back because there is no 2 John chapter 2. Okay. Second John chapter two, verse. Second John chapter one. Wait a minute, I'm trying to get over there. Let me get over there. Verse number seven, not second John chapter two, is second John chapter one, verse seven. All right, watch this. Watch this verse. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Now, note this. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. What is that verse saying? What is John saying? John is saying that there are many antichrists in the world right now. The key to this verse, watch this, is that last word. Antichrist. Anybody that is anti antichrist, meaning against Christ, is an antichrist. Are you getting it? And so, what is, let me give you another verse. Um, First John, just go up. First John. First John, chapter two. And look at verse twenty-two. Watch this. First John. Chapter 2 and verse 22. I think I gave you the wrong scripture for the first, but you got it. Watch this. Who is a liar? Watch this. But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ, he is antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Y'all see that? Watch this. Can you pull up verse 23? Watch this. Watch what verse 23 says. No one who denies the son has the father. Are you getting that? Whoever so, whosoever denieth the son, the same hath not the father. There are some religions, get this, that acknowledge Jesus but not God. There are some religions that acknowledge God but not Jesus. Look at what John is saying. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same have not the Father. But he that acknowledges the Son hath the Father also. All right? Now, the key thing I want you to see in this text 
is Paul is telling us that they have denied. Matter of fact, when we look at this, if you understand the rationale here between uh, the Pharisees and Sadducees and all the others, the key thing that you're going to get is that they wanted to acknowledge circumcision. All right? Jesus said, you don't need that. I'm all you need. All right? And what they want to do was, remember, circumcision was connected to the law. So what they were trying to do is they were trying to say, in essence, if you don't keep the law, then you cannot be saved. Matter of fact, what they were trying to do in actuality was connect the law and the cross together. And the cross is the only way that you can be saved. Can I give you two scriptures to connect with this? Uh, Galatians chapter 1 and verse number 7. Galatians chapter 1. And verse number seven. Watch verse six. Can we go to verse six? Galatians chapter one and verse six and verse seven. Watch this. Look at Paul talking to the church at Galatia. He said, listen, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ Unto another God. Paul said, look, I'm just blown away that everything you've been told, all of a sudden you've walked away from it. Look at verse 7. Watch this. Watch what he says. Which is not another, but there be some trouble that, there be, there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Paul said, I'm, I'm just blown away that you've been trained <clears throat> to understand the gospel of Christ centers around the cross, but you didn't let somebody come in and trick you just that fast. Now, can I pause there for a second? That's why you always hear me warning you. Now, let's make sure we understand this. I'm not going to ever tell you that you can't visit anybody else, church. I'm, not, I'm never going to tell you that. What I'm going to be careful and warn you about is be careful of eating food from another person's kitchen. Are you getting that? You, you need to be careful because if you don't watch it, that food may taste good going down, but you don't know what it's going to do to you on the inside. You cannot endorse everybody else's cooking. That's critical. Okay? So what Paul is saying, I'm surprised. Paul is saying in those two, I'm surprised that you've abandoned everything you've been taught because something sounds good to you. All right? L look at this verse. Uh, Galatians chapter 6 and, and verse number 12. Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 12. Watch this. Here's what he's saying. As many as desire to make a fair show, watch this, in the flesh, look at this. They constrain you. They trick you. They try to exhort you to what? To be circumcised. Watch this. Only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. What are they saying? You don't have to believe the cross. All you got to do is be circumcised, and that's enough. Now, I want to make you clear. I want to make sure you get this, and I'm going to take it to you right now so you can get it. Here's the thing we have to understand, that the purpose of the law was to be a teacher to hold you until Jesus Christ came back on the scene. All right? Can I give you that scripture? Go to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. And I want to start with verse, uh, first of all, I want to look at verse number 10. Galatians is a powerful study. As a matter of fact, look forward after we finish this, we're going to try to push into Galatians. Watch this. Watch what this verse says. For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things that are written in the book of the law to do them. What is Paul telling us? 
if you're not going to do everything under the law, you're cursed. So let me ask you a question. And this is me. Which one would you choose? Would you choose to be under the law or would you choose to be under grace? All right. Now, that's critical. Now, the law is good, but the law doesn't save you. Now, watch this. All right. Let me let me read in, in the same in the same book. Watch this. Let me see if I can pick it up right quick. Uh, verse 19. Go to verse 19. Galatians chapter 3, verse 19. Watch this. Wherefore then serveth the law. Why are you then serving the law? Watch this. It was added because of transgressions. Till the seed, note this, underline this, till the seed should come to those the promise was made. Lord have mercy. Do you see it? The purpose of the law was to hold you until the seed came. Who is the seed? The seed is Jesus Christ. Watch this. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. All right? Watch this. Let me see if I'm going to jump down a little bit. Go to verse number 20, verse 22. Verse 22. Watch this. But the scripture have concluded all under sin that the promise of faith by Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Go to the next verse, just verse 23. Watch this. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. All of us were under the law until faith came. What is our faith in? Our faith is in the cross. The redemptive work of God, what he did on the cross. All right? Watch this. Verse 24. Watch this. I'm going to just kind of walk into it. Verse 24 says, here it is, critical. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster. What was the purpose of the law? To bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. I, I, are you getting this? That echoes the summation of the purpose of the law. It was to hold us until Christ came on the scene to redeem us. Go to verse 25. Watch this. Now that faith is come. We are no longer under a schoolmaster. We're no longer under the law. We now operate by faith. And so Paul was telling us that we are to emphasize the Christ. Satan, Satan, or emphasize the cross, rather. Satan doesn't want you to talk about the cross. All right? And mankind doesn't. It is the finishing work of God. It says, in, in essence, that God is finished with this present world. All right? Watch this. Let me see if I can give you a message to help you with this. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 17. And this is going to help somebody. Watch this. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting with verse 17. Now watch this. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Now watch this. Here's what I want you to see. Not with the wisdom of words, watch this, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. I'm not trying to convince you with words. I'm going to point you to the cross. That's what Paul is saying. Look at verse 18. Watch this. Why is he saying that? Look at verse 18, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Watch this. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Lord have mercy. Did you see that? When you start talking about the cross, 
People think that's foolishness. I, I can't understand that. How can one man dying on a cross can save everybody? Watch this now. Don't get caught up in trying to do anything other than the cross. The only way you can get to God is by the cross. Now, in human imagination, that sounds foolishness. How can one man dying save all men? That's why it's considered foolishness. But watch this now. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Are you getting it? Watch this. Watch verse 19. Verse 19 says this. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. What is God saying? God is saying, in essence, I'm going to destroy the mindset of all the most intellectual people that you know. Are you understanding this? God says, I'm going to do something that confounds or just blows your mind. Now, think about this. Jesus Christ came down through 40 and two generations. The Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary. She was pregnant. She gave birth. All right. Jesus then died, was placed in a tomb and got up three days later. Now, the human mind cannot phantom that. Because in our minds, when people die, they go to their grave. A woman cannot be pregnant without the seed of a male. All right? It confounds the scholars and the wise. But there's a lot of things that happen in life that we've not yet figured out. All right? That's why it says the message of the cross is perishing or foolishness to those who are perishing. Can I give you another scripture? Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And I want to start at verse number 6. And I want to read down to verse 14 because it's going to help me help you get the point. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6. How be it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. Watch this. Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world. The language we talking didn't come from a president. It didn't come from a Harvard, a Harvard professor. It didn't come from the person that got the Nobel Peace Prize. It didn't come from Mahatma Gandhi. It didn't come from Mother Teresa. All right? It didn't come. It says, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. Because get this now. People die every second. Presidents die every second. It doesn't matter how intellectual you are. All of us are going to die. Watch this. Watch the next verse. Look at verse 7. He says this. He says, but the wisdom of God in a mystery. He says, but we speak the wisdom, rather, of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom with God ordained before the world unto our glory. In other words, Paul said, look, we telling you stuff that at one point God hid from everybody. But he now is revealing it unto you. Watch this. Keep going. Verse 8. Watch this. Watch this, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Does that make sense to you? What Paul is saying is, had Herod and the Pharisees and Sadducees and all, had they actually known the mystery of the gospel would be Jesus dying on a cross, they would not have crucified him. Now watch this next verse. This way you're going to shout because you hear us quote this scripture all the time, but we never actually see people putting it in the right context. Watch this. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard nor has entered the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Can I get you to pause right there? I want to talk about this real briefly because if you just read 7, 8, and 9, your take on this scripture ought to be different. Because when you think about 7, 8, and 9, 
what it's saying. We take that verse and we start talking about all the other things going on. I want you to see that that verse right there is really in connectedness to the message of the cross. We take it out of context all the time. Watch this. Look at verse number 10. Watch this. But God had revealed him to us by what? By his spirit. For the spirit searcheth all things, yes, the deep things of God. Keep going. Watch this. Look at verse 11. For what man knoweth the things of a man, except the spirit of a man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Keep going. Watch this. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things which are freely given to us. Now, freely given to us. God gave his son, freely given to us. Watch this. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man, man's wisdom teaches, teacheth rather, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Watch this. Keep going. Verse 14. But the natural man, watch this, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness. There that word is again. The message of the cross is foolishness. So the things that the Spirit of God is teaching us is that the cross is the way we can be saved. But the natural man cannot receive them because they sound like foolishness under him and neither can he know them know this hallelujah because they are spiritually discerned what is God telling you there all right but he that is spiritual judges all things yet he himself is not judged of no man in those verses from verse number six all the way down to 14 God is saying, I'm going to share some things with you through my spirit about how you can live. And the way you can live is by the cross. But everybody's not going to understand it because it is not it is not discerned by the natural man, but discerned by the spiritual man. And the only way you can get it is my spirit has to connect with your spirit. Let me go back to this verse and see if you can put it up again, uh, Trinell. Um, verse number nine. Verse nine says this, 2 Corinthians chapter two. But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, nor had entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. God said, I prepared this before time. You didn't know this. It was my plan. All right? All right? Now, I want to push that a little bit because let me give you the secular type of thinking about this. I have not seen, ear have not heard, nor is it in the heart of man, the thing we've got to prepare. A lot of people think that has to do with prosperity. It really doesn't unless you consider Jesus that prosperity. If you just read those verses... And that's why as a Bible scholar, you got to learn how to read more than a verse. If you just read those verses, what God said to you was, I have shared something. I've told you that Jesus, by way of the cross, would save you. And to people that don't understand that, it's going to be foolishness. But to those that my spirit has connected with, we can embrace it because we truly understand the significance of the cross. All right? Watch this. Let's go back to Philippians chapter 3, verse 19. All right? That's why many people live as enemies of God. Because most people are enemies, rather, of the cross of Christ. Because they don't want to embrace the cross. All right? That's critical. 
They don't want to embrace the cross. And if you don't embrace the cross, then you cannot embrace Christ. That making sense? Now watch this. Philippians uh, chapter 3, verse 18. I'm going to read this and then move right into verse 19. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you weeping. It bothered Paul that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. All right, watch verse 19. Now watch this. This is critical. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is their shame, is in their shame, who mine earthly things. Paul's put the kickstand down. Watch this. All right, watch this. This is the issue of their doctrine and their conduct. They are here described by three different things. And I know you can see them. Watch this. It says their God is their belly. That's number one. All right. They live not in, not in any reference to eternity. They ain't even thinking about that. Their religion is for time. All right. They make a gain of godliness and they live only to eat, drink and be merry. How many of y'all know somebody like right now, like that right now? The only thing they're thinking about is how can I get more? How can I be praised? How can I drive the finest car? How can I get more money? Look at all my degrees. Look how big my church is. Look how big the building is that we just built. Their end, their destruction is their belly. Here's number two. You see it right there. Their glory is their shame. In other words, they lay it down as proof of their address that they can fare sumptuously every day. All right, get this now. So in consequence of preaching a doctrine which flatters a passion of their hearers, what they're looking for is for you to pat them on their back and say, oh, Reverend, oh, brother teacher, oh, sister teacher, that was such a moving thing. They live for that glory. All they want you to do is tell them how great they are. I know you know somebody like that right now. All right? It might even be you. You might even be disturbed if somebody shows up. Or let me say it like this. You might be disturbed. Man, I was teaching man and I knew I was doing stuff and only two people showed up. See, for you, your glory is numbers. But I need to remind you, brothers and sisters, and I say this often, I'm teaching to one. Now, I want you to get that in the right perspective. I'm teaching for an audience of, uh, uh, let me say it again. Let me put it a different way. I'm teaching to an audience of three. God the Father, you got it. God the Son, yes. And God, the Holy Spirit. Now, I said an audience of one because they are one. But if I say an audience of three, I'm still talking about one. All right? All right. So when I'm teaching, now get this. I don't think many people understand teaching or preaching. When I'm teaching and preaching, I want you to get this. God is watching me. I, I, I think sometimes we misunderstand this. God is watching me take his words and send them to you. Jesus, <laughs> Jesus is literally watching me talk to you about him. And the Holy Ghost, who was supposed to be directing me into all truth, is looking at me, making sure that everything I'm saying matches what God said. I don't think many people truly understand that. Can you now understand why every time I'm preaching, I'm nervous? Can you understand why I'm cautious about things I say and do behind this sacred desk? I've got an audience of three. 
God has trusted me with his word. God is looking to see what I'm going to say. I'm testifying about Jesus. Jesus said, wait a minute now. Now, Tatum, now you know I didn't do that. Now, I'm not saying he'd actually say that. And the Holy Ghost, who was designed to bring me into all truth, is saying, now, wait a minute now. Now, you embellishing that. Embellishing means that I'm inflating it. In other words, I'm lying. Can you understand the weight on our shoulders as preachers that when we are preaching, three people are always looking at us? I don't know if that's ever been put in the right perspective for you. I hope that right now you have a different perspective of why we preach like we do. I really hope you do. I'm always preaching to an audience of three. God, Jesus, and the Holy Ghost. And God is trying to see if what I'm saying matches what he said. Jesus is trying to see if what I'm saying about him is accurate. And the Holy Ghost, who is to guide me in all truth, is looking at every word in Scripture and saying, where you get that from? Because that ain't even in my text. That's not even in my Scripture. I'm just trying to give you a different perspective. All right? Look at the third one. The third one in that text, whose God is their belly, whose glory is their shame, and the third one is, who mind earthly things. Watch this. They hold study and attention are taken up with earthly matters. They're not talking spiritual. All they focus on is the immediacy. Money, money, money. If you give right now, a blessing is going to come. That's called prosperity gospel. And as believers, we got to be very careful that everything we're talking about is not just about money and big houses and driving fine cars. That's not the gospel. That's a portion of the benefit of the relationship. But if you're not talking about living holy, if you're not talking about forgiveness, hello, somebody. If you're not talking about not taking matters in your own hands, if you're not talking about lifting the Savior up and living how he lived, you way off track. And so there has to be a balance in terms of our preaching and our teaching. I love celebrating, but there's got to be some moments that when I open the Holy Writ, the Holy Ghost is going to tell me, now in this sermon, this is what you need to talk about. Where we go wrong as preachers and teachers is when we only want to make you happy. And the gospel is not designed to make you happy. As a matter of fact, the gospel is designed to disturb the comfortable and to, how does that phrase go? It's designed to disturb the comfortable, which is you, and and designed to comfort the uncomfortable. That making sense? All right, I think I got just a couple minutes left. So watch this. Let me see if I can push this a little bit. Let me give you a scripture to connect with this. Um, Romans chapter 8, and I want to start with verse number 5. Because I need to ask you a question right there, with that verse right there. Can a Christian be carnal? This is probably where I'm going to end, and I'm going to pick this up next week. But I'm going to ask you the question. Can a Christian be carnal? The answer is, yes, they can. Yes, they can. Watch this. This is Romans chapter 8, verse 5. I'm going to read down through verse number 9. Watch this. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the of the spirit. That's critical. Watch this. Look at verse number six. For to be carnal minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Keep going. Watch this. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. The word enmity means it is separated from. All right. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Watch this. 
So then they, yeah, you see it, that are in the flesh cannot please God. Watch this. Watch verse 9. But she are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Notice that now. But you are not in the flesh, but are in the spirit. If the spirit of God lives in you. Now, if you have not the spirit of Christ. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Let me pause. That's a good place to, to just kind of get ready to end. So I asked a question before I read that scripture. Can a Christian be carnal? Yes. Yes, you can. You can be saved, but still gravitate to pleasing the flesh. Yes, you can. Let me help you. Why do you think there are some Christians in the church that physically don't talk to each other no more? Because they're operating from a mindset of carnality. Why do you literally think some Christians have physically gotten into a physical fight right in the church? Because they were operating, yes, according to the flesh. Why do you think some people have left the church? Because they kept looking at things occurring in the church from a flesh perspective and not from a spiritual perspective. And when you operate in the flesh, you cannot please God himself. I'm going to pick up on this next week because I think at the end of the day, we've got to begin to ask ourselves, are you flesh driven or are you spirit led? Now, watch this. <laughs> Let me say it like this. I hope that what I'm saying right now is challenging you. All right. And it's challenging you for a couple reasons. Number one. What it says is, or what it says to you, is do my actions represent the flesh or do they represent the spirit? I'm looking forward to seeing you on Friday, Friday morning, noon prayer. Looking forward to seeing you. There are several ways you can give. Friday. All right. So let me give you several ways to give. There are several ways to give. Number one, you can drop off your giving on Saturdays, Thursdays and Saturdays. Thursdays and Saturdays, between the time of 10 a.m. and noon. You can make your, you can mail your gift in New Life Baptist Church Ministries, 1401 Jane Street, Saginaw, Michigan, 48601. Uh, there are three technological ways you can give. PayPal is New Life BCM. That's all one word. You can give through Cash App. That's dollar sign New Life BCM. And then finally, you can give through New Life or through Givelify. New Life Ministries. Now, don't forget Friday at the noon hour. Friday at the noon hour, we will have prayer. All right, Friday at the noon hour. All right, don't forget that. Invite your friends and loved ones. I'm looking forward to seeing you then. It is our prayer that God will bless you and that God will bless you.